Hello and welcome to Random Interesting Facts, the podcast about everything and nothing, with your host, 42. This week's theme is bombs. That's bombs as in B-O-M-B-S, by the way. I'm not just saying bombs with a posh accent. So let's dive right into fact number one. The US Air Force once explored the possibility of producing a gay bomb. Now we all know the US military is well known for its war-leading technology and innovation. But in 1994, the US Department of Defense got a little bored of just blowing people to smithereens. So they started to explore ideas of non-lethal weapons, which sounds great in principle. They wanted to find weapons that wouldn't just destroy the enemy, but would instead disrupt and debilitate enemy soldiers on the battlefield. But there was one consistent theme which kept coming up sex. So basically they needed to weaponize sex. Everyone was quite keen on the idea, they just didn't know how to do it. After all, they couldn't just attack the opposing army wearing some revealing lingerie. Because you know it makes you a little vulnerable and where are you going to store your grenades and ammo and sandwiches? And then there was the issue that most soldiers are male. So, of course, they came to the inevitable conclusion that in order to weaponize sex on the battlefield, they had to just go ahead and try to make the enemy turn gay. I kid you not, the US Department of Defense spent millions of dollars, $7.5 million, in fact, was invested into this little scheme, into trying to engineer a bomb that contained some kind of chemical or pheromones which they could drop above the heads of the enemy soldiers and it would turn them into homosexuals. And if you ask me, this seems to be an extremely narrow-minded view of homosexuals, but they, for some reason, presumed that because the enemy had suddenly become homosexuals, they'd all of a sudden stop attacking the American troops and become irresistibly attracted to each other mid-gunfight. Now, I know this sounds like a joke, but it really isn't. In fact, they put together a three-page proposal in which they detailed this new invention, codenamed the Gay Bomb, which detailed the use of pheromones as a strong aphrodisiac to induce homosexual behaviour on the battlefield. And I don't know what that means. I mean, Homosexual behaviour was their words, not mine. Now, it sounds completely insane, but there were documents released to a biological weapons watchdog based in Austin, Texas, that confirmed the US military did indeed investigate this idea. And amazingly, even when directly asked, the Pentagon have never denied that this proposal was explored. Because, you know, why would they? It's obviously 100% sane. In fact, they're quoted as saying something akin to quite the opposite. In their words, the Department of Defense is committed to identifying, researching, and developing non-lethal weapons that will support our men and women in uniform. Now, I should clear this up at this point. There have been no reputable scientific studies that have ever demonstrated Pheromones can cause a rapid change in sexual behaviour or indeed preferences of humans. But, you know, that didn't stop our plucky Air Force scientists from giving it a good go. In order to attempt to make their gay bomb more effective, they explored the idea of adding some exotic ingredients in the mix, such as a variety of different scents that would waft down over the heads of the soldiers and, uh, and, you know, strike a love affair betwixt men. Now, thankfully, the gay bomb was only ever theoretical and never put into motion. You know, it always amazes me 
how ostensibly highly intelligent people working for the most preeminent bodies on the planet come up with the most insane ideas. You see it everywhere. This is just one such example. Ideas that your average layman, such as you and I, would look at and go, no, what are you thinking? Stop. Don't, please don't spend $7.5 million on a gay bomb. Why did you even wake up this morning and think about even suggesting it at work? Just go home. But it's nice to know our tax dollars are being well spent, I suppose. Although, you know, if the gay bomb had have been a real thing, I would have absolutely loved to have seen it dropped on the Westboro Baptist Church. That would be some sweet, sweet revenge. Now, fortunately, the gay bomb didn't go ahead, of course, but some equally unusual and bizarre ideas for chemical warfare very much did go into the stages of experimental production. Look, at this point, I, I'm just going to declare that the Air Force clearly has way too much time on their hands. I mean, you know, maybe we do need a third world war just to give them something to bloody do. Okay, so amongst these bizarre chemical warfare weapons was the Sting Me Bomb, which would drop a scent on the enemy that attracts swarms of enraged wasps. I mean, is it just me? Or is the US military weirdly obsessed with seeing the enemy get penetrated by something? Anything. Another incredible idea was a bomb which makes people's skin unbelievably sensitive to the sun. Which sounds like a good idea in principle, until you run into an army of ginger people who are so used to instant sunburn, it wouldn't make a damn difference to just continue fighting on anyway. You know, ginger people get sunburnt when they open the fridge. They're not going to bother about being 5% more sensitive to sunlight. Then there was another proposal which would apparently cause severe and lasting halitosis. Now, maybe you've clocked on, but I'm not entirely sure how an epidemic of bad breath in the enemy ranks would work in our favour. Then there was yet another proposed bomb called the Who? Me? Bomb? That was the genuine codename, by the way, but we can essentially just call it a gargantuan stink bomb. Its aim was to create a massive outbreak of flatulence scents in the enemy camp. It was supposed to contain a range of farty smells, uh, combining various delightful fragrances, some of which were vomit, goats, Yes, just the scent of goats, because obviously we all know what goats smell like and it's bleeding terrible. And of course, the old chestnut smelly feet. I mean, like seriously, do they, do they have five-year-olds working for the Pentagon? Now we're going to create this bomb, it's fantastic. And you know what it does is it, it drenches the enemy in the most horrendous sense you can possibly imagine that we can engineer in the lab, we can create the most awful, nose-bleeding, gut-wrenching sense. So, anybody got any ideas? Uh, how about smelly feet? Yes! Perfect! Let's put it into action. <laughs> so all of this, again, you know, sounds completely mental, but according to one Captain Dan McSweeney of the Pentagon, the Department of Defense actually receives hundreds of these projects per year, and most of them are quickly reviewed and put to one side. Um, some of them go a little bit further, um, but thankfully none of these um, aforementioned bizarre proposals have ever been developed and used on the battlefield, so far as we know. Weird if you ask me. You know, it's it's almost as if turning the enemy forces into gay soldiers who smell of farts, mm -hmm. bad breath, 
and are covered in wasp stings all over, was for some reason deemed to be an ineffective idea. <laughs> In 2007, though, the researchers who originally conceptualised the gay bomb were awarded the Ig Nobel Prize, a parody award. It's for science that first makes people laugh and then makes them think. Like, you know, I thought, why the bloody hell would anyone want to do that? Next up, moments from history. <laughs> where we go back and look at a particularly bizarre but interesting moment from history. In this episode, we recount the time Napoleon Bonaparte was attacked by 300 rabbits. Yes, you heard me right. Now, to give you a short bit of background on the man, the myth, the legend, the bit of French rabbit food, Napoleon Bonaparte was born in 1769. He rose to prominence as a French military and political leader during the French Revolution. Although today, I think he's mostly known as that short bloke who's always got his hand in his coat. Napoleon absolutely dominated European and very much global affairs from 1803 to 1815, whilst leading his country, France, in a series of coalitions in the Napoleonic Wars. I mean, the name itself is a bit of a giveaway. The fact it was named after him means he probably did quite well. And sure enough, during the Napoleonic Wars, he conquered Egypt, Belgium, Holland, much of Italy, Austria, much of Germany, Poland, and Spain. Assuming the moniker Napoleon I, he declared himself emperor from 1804 until 1814, and once again in 1815. Of course, Napoleon's final and most upsetting defeat came at Waterloo on the 18th of June, 1815. What I'm willing to bet you didn't learn in school, however, was that only eight years earlier, he suffered an even more humiliating defeat after being attacked by a relentless horde of rabbits. Now, there's a couple of versions of this story knocking about, but most agree it happened in July of 1807, just after Napoleon signed the Treaties of Tilsit, which ended the war between the French Empire and Imperial Russia. Now, Napoleon had an urge to celebrate the end of this conflict by shooting something cute in the face. And so, he proposed a rabbit hunt and he asked his chief of staff, Alexandra Berthier, to make it happen. Sure enough, Berthier arranged an outdoor luncheon, invited some of the military's biggest brass, and somehow procured a huge collection of rabbits. Some sources say it was 300, but others claim it was as many as 3,000 rabbits. That's a lot of rabbits. The carrot bill alone must have been quite staggering. When Napoleon started to prowl, accompanied by beaters and gun bearers, the rabbits were released from their cages. And as we all know, there's nothing in life more dangerous than a caged rabbit, as we all learnt in Beatrix Potter's book, Peter Rabbit and His Flesh-Eating Cousins. Did you not read that one? Oh, it was fantastic. Now, you're probably imagining, with all these guns and angry little Frenchmen about, the rabbits probably immediately scurried away into the distance. Mm, no, not quite. In fact, they did the direct opposite. As soon as the cages were opened, they bounded straight towards Napoleon and his men. Initially, Napoleon's party had a good little chuckle. Until suddenly, the rabbit started swarming the emperor's legs and then climbing up his jacket. Ah! And as the emperor of France, there's surely nothing more embarrassing than 3,000 rabbits nibbling at your nipples. Napoleon tried desperately to shoo them away with his riding crop, and his men grabbed sticks and tried chasing them away. The coachmen cracked their bullwhips. 
But the rabbit just kept on coming, like the beast of Keir Banog. And sure enough, these rabbits had a vicious streak a mile wide. So in a desperate hurry, Napoleon retreated, he fled to his carriage. But the bunnies didn't stop their onslaught with their big pointy teeth. In fact, the rabbits divided into two separate wings. They poured around the flanks of the party and headed directly for the coach. Like a typhoon of fluffy white death, they engulfed the carriage, reportedly some leapt inside it. The vicious bunny attack only ceased as the coach started to roll away from the scene. Alas, the great emperor, Napoleon I, was no match for a battle against bunnies. It's quite a surprise all the European countries he conquered didn't enlist rabbits instead of guns and soldiers. The trouble was, you see, rather than trapping wild hares who have a bit of a scaredy cat streak, Berthier's men had bought tame rabbits from local farmers. So they didn't see Napoleon as a fearsome hunter, but as a light snack and perhaps a cuddle buddy. From 1810, the tide then began to turn against Napoleon. He suffered several military defeats and in 1812 completely failed to invade Russia. You know what I think it is? I think the rabbits knocked his confidence. In Russia, France was forced to retreat and of the original 400,000 frontline troops, fewer than 40,000 returned. You could say they were decimated like a field of lettuce. Paris fell in March of 1814 and Napoleon went into exile on the island of Elba, over which he was given sovereignty. Then after popping off the island for another stab at the British, he was finally defeated at the Battle of Waterloo and exiled by the British to the island of St. Helena, where he would spend the remainder of his days and finally croak it because of some poisoned wallpaper. At least that's what we suspect. Now I think it's time we take a little break to absorb all that information. And when we return, I have two more fantastic facts for you. See you in just a moment. Welcome back, and here's two more facts about this week's theme, bombs. Fact number two. Forged works of art can be identified due to nuclear explosions from the past. Art forgeries have always been an issue throughout history to some extent, but it was from the 1960s onwards that the art world was besieged by a torrent of fake masterpieces. This problem only grew exponentially through the 1980s and 90s as the market for modern art exploded. Ah yes, modern art. I mean, to be honest, if you ask me, if you're willing to pay millions of pounds for a cow preserved in formaldehyde, then frankly, you deserve everything you get. And art forgers are becoming more and more advanced with each year. They're capable now of producing fake works of art so perfect in every way, from the materials used to the artistry itself and the unique brushstrokes of the original painter, that even well-trained experts are unable to differentiate an original from a copy. Mind you, when I visited the Tate Modern in London, I had a very similar experience. I was completely unable to differentiate uh, what was supposed to be real art from absolute shit. I, I genuinely couldn't decide if the mopping bucket in front of me in the middle of the damn floor was supposed to be art or if the caretaker had just pissed off for a toilet break and left it there. But yeah, whether it's traditional paintings or modern art, art forgery itself has been reduced down to a fine art these days. Their close attention to detail, even reproducing old paints that would have been used 50, 100 or more years ago, binders and canvases. Some fakes are actually better than the originals in a strange kind of way. Although usually the signature gives it away, you know, if he's accidentally signed it Barry instead of Leonardo. 
But alas, the art world does have one unlikely ally when it comes to finding forgeries. And no, unfortunately, it's not a sniffer dog with a fine art degree. Is it just me or are you imagining that dog wearing a cardigan and a monocle? Oh, maybe it's just me. And this ally, which I'm about to discuss, was discovered by art historian Dr. Eleanor Bassner, who noticed that forgers had already exhausted all of her angles. They were looking at every single aspect of the artwork themselves and even tracing back uh, its, its path to, you know, establish where, how it arrived at its current location and ownership. So the art forgery detective world, as it were, um, was lost for ideas. And then Dr. Eleanor Basner came up with an unusual one. Atomic bombs. You see, just after um, art forgeries became a huge epidemic, something quite unique happened in the history of our planets, N not, you know, two, three decades before. And that was, between 1945 and 1963, a whopping 550 nuclear weapons, 552 if you count Hiroshima and Nagasaki, were exploded around the world during tests, until the limited test ban treaty outlawed all above ground detonations. But if you ask me, that's just health and safety gone mad. Now, as you may imagine, exploding thousands of megatons of atomic bombs around the world has its side effects. And one such side effect is that it releases two fully artificial isotopes that are only ever formed during nuclear bomb blasts. Those are cesium-137 and strontium-90. Most of these isotopes were absorbed by the soil and incorporated into the cellular structure of plants. So if you're wondering why potatoes from deepest Siberia taste so wonderful, it's because of all those yummy radioactive isotopes. But it's not just soil and plants that absorb these isotopes. In fact, they were absorbed into just about everything. Animals, buildings, people, pretty much everyone alive in between 1945 and 1963 had elevated levels of these isotopes. This period of time is known as the bomb peak, which makes it sound kind of cool in a weird way. It's like, oh, were you not exploding thermonuclear devices during the bomb peak? Huh. <laughs> uh, why did anyone even talk to you? These isotopes are reducing now with each passing year, but each isotope has a half-life of around 30 years, which means they're going to remain pretty prominent in our soil and various objects and people around the world for a long, long time to come yet. But it's the sheer quantity that was absorbed into the soil and thus into plants, which is so fundamental in identifying forged pieces of art. And this is where it gets interesting because you see, a common binding agent in paint production happens to be linseed oil. And where does linseed oil come from? Congratulations you if you got it, it's from the flax plant. And where does the flax plant grow? In the soil, of course. And what's in the soil? These aforementioned isotopes. So the isotopes from the soil go into the flax plant, which gets processed into linseed oil, which is used as a binding agent in paint. And if you've already figured out by now how this helps us to identify forged works of art, then you're a clever little cookie, aren't you? So just because a flax plant has been processed into linseed oil and then used as a binding agent in paint, it doesn't mean that those isotopes just go away. No, in fact, the cesium-137 and strontium-90 isotopes are present in modern paints, at least paints created after the 1940s. Which of course means that if cesium-137 and strontium-90 are present within a painting, then it could not possibly have been created before 1945. 
because remember those isotopes can only be created during the explosion of a nuclear bomb. Basner's isotope test is also incredibly popular because it only requires a minuscule sample from the canvas taken from the very edge of the frame to carry out this test. Which means, of course, if you're testing the validity of a painting of the crucifixion, you don't need to rip off Christ's entire face. Because, you know, that kind of thing is generally frowned upon, especially if it was hanging in the Vatican. An art collector called Peggy Guggenheim was once famously duped into purchasing a painting by a French artist called Ferdinand Leger, which was completed around 1913. But after spending decades in her private collection, it turned out to well and truly be a fake. Which must have been like waking up next to your wife of 20 years and realizing it's actually her brother in a mask. <laughs> Dr. Basner herself worked on the identification of this particular forgery and employed the bomb peak technique to identify those isotopes we talked about. And indeed, it exhibited significantly elevated isotope levels. Thus, she concluded that it was actually produced between 1959 and 1962 four years after Leisure died. Which means he couldn't have painted it because corpses make crap painters. Their brushstrokes are just too stiff. Another forger who fell foul of isotopes was Robert Trotter. He would often purchase old paintings, which he then stripped, repainted, artificially aged, and placed in antique frames. But everything quickly unraveled after scientists analysed one of his paintings in particular. Village Scene with Horse. Ooh, sounds exciting. It was supposedly painted by Sarah Hon in 1866. And this time they only took a single paint particle from the canvas to investigate. Which is a testament to how incredibly sensitive the bomb peak method is. I know, I know, a single particle of paint will just ruin that painting. But you know, it's, it's hardly noticeable when you've got the mind-blowing excitement of a village and a horse to keep your mind focused on. <coughs> There's another isotope, actually, that's known to have dramatically increased after the nuclear tests, and that's carbon-14. Scientists found, in this case, that although the canvas could have been crafted at any point between the late 1600s and mid-1900s, there was enough carbon-14 in the paint itself to date it to the post-war period. In fact, it's highly likely it was created in the late 50s or mid-80s, so it could have either been painted by someone with sideburns or leg warmers, but they couldn't quite decide which. Ultimately, Trotter admitted to selling 52 falsified paintings and served 10 months in prison. Which doesn't sound like a lot to me. I mean, that's roughly five and a half days per painting. You know, maybe it is worth me knocking off a quick last supper. I could retire on the sale for that one. Following Trotter's conviction, Buffalo State College acquired the Sarah Hon canvas, supposedly, which has since been studied to better understand forgery methods, and also to understand why anyone would pay serious money for a painting of a horse. <coughs> Sadly though, the usefulness of the bomb peak method appears to be expiring. Levels of carbon-14 and the aforementioned isotopes in the atmosphere are now returning to pre-bomb levels, mostly as these particles are being absorbed by the ocean. And yes, that's terrible news for the art world. It's going to become increasingly difficult to identify forgeries. So I don't know what we have to do about that. I guess we just have to have another full-on nuclear war so we can keep finding forgeries, hey? Now moving on to fact number three. There are bombs everywhere. Yes, literally everywhere. There's probably one not too far from you right now. And especially if you're in Europe. Because there are more than 50 million World War II bombs, 
detonators and ammunition at the bottom of the North and Baltic Seas. After the Second World War, to try and get Germany to be a little less naughty and, you know, genocidal, they were ordered to disarm and dispose of all their ammunition as quickly as possible. Now, the easiest way to do this was to just load the ammunition onto ships, take it out to sea, and throw it overboard. And that's exactly what was done. In German waters alone, there are about 1.6 million tonnes of bombs, 1.3 million in the North Sea and 300,000 in the Baltic Sea. Oh, well, that's not a problem, you might be thinking. Just send somebody down there in a diving suit and a rifle and shoot them to explode them. Well, simply blowing them up isn't such a great idea, you see. Because when a 500 kilogram bomb explodes, the shrapnel that's produced will be distributed over hundreds of miles by the water currents. And just because it's underwater, it doesn't mean the effect of the blast isn't also incredibly devastating. It will kill divers and fish if they are anywhere within a few hundred meters of the explosion. Even if all the fish heed our advice and locate shelter a suitable distance away from the blast site, it can still damage fish's hearing, which is particularly bad news for species that use sounds to navigate, hunt, or avoid predators. And it's not just the explosive force of the bombs which is an issue. During World War II, the German military used a lot of bombs that contained a highly toxic mix of chemicals. One such chemical tonic, for instance, was called HND. Used during bombs in World War II, it's highly carcinogenic and mutagenic. And over the coming decades, these bombs will corrode and the various poisonous contents will be set free and enter the ecosystem. We've already found extremely high concentrations of arsenic in fish caught in the Baltic Sea, and it's been confirmed that poison gas ammunition is the cause of this. And the situation isn't much better with conventional ammunition, because as the explosive crumbles, particles will eventually get so small they can be absorbed by the smallest of sea creatures, such as mussels. Finding a pearl in an oyster is one thing, but I think finding a shard of Nazi bomb in your muscle isn't quite as precious somehow. The only real solution is to recover the bombs as quickly as possible and dispose of them, which is just a monumental undertaking. Personally, I don't know why we can't just make it into a reality TV show. We seem to be doing that with everything else these days. They, they're getting more and more ridiculous by the year. Let's just take a bunch of wannabes, put them in diving suits, and see how many bombs they can collect before blowing themselves up. I'm sure we won't run into any health and safety issues whatsoever. I'd certainly enjoy it more than X Factor anyway. There's also plenty of unexploded World War II bombs hidden within the soil across the UK mainland and across mainland Europe, particularly in Belgium around Flanders, unexploded World War I bombs are a huge issue for farmers. Over in the UK, the Ministry of Defence says that since 2010, it's been involved with disarming around 60 German World War II bombs every year. However, we still don't know the exact number of bombs still out there, nor do we have any idea as to their likely locations. So, if your granny suddenly gets projected a thousand feet into the air, when she's walking to the post office. Just blame the Nazis. Over in Vietnam, they have a very similar problem. 800,000 tons of bombs, mines, and other explosive weaponry are buried across the country, many of which were dropped by US bombers during the war. The USA and Russia have found quite the novel solution to disarming their old bombs, however. For the past couple of decades, 10% of US electricity was generated from dismantled atomic bombs. Between 1993 and 2013, Russia and the USA have collaborated on the Megatons to Megawatts program, in which the USA purchased 500 tons of uranium from Russian warheads to meet the needs of their many nuclear power plants. 
Because as we know, the Soviet Union has quite a lot of old nuclear weaponry knocking around. After the Soviet Union fell, for example, Ukraine was left with the third largest nuclear stockpile on Earth. And I think I can speak for all of us when I say it's probably wise we take it out of their hands as quickly as possible, because the Ukraine doesn't have the best history with atomic energy. <laughs> Although, I think we can probably blame that on the USSR. And that was Random Interesting Facts. Thank you for listening, and I'd absolutely love to hear your comments and suggestions for future episodes. And also be sure to like, review, and subscribe. Please do leave a comment if you've learned something new from this episode. And if you have your very own random interesting fact that you're just bursting to share with me, then tweet it using the hashtag Riff Podcast. That's R I F Podcast. Each week I'll choose my favourite fact from my lovely listeners and shout it out at the end of my next episode. So remember, tweet your interesting fact using the hashtag Riff Podcast. And thanks again for listening.